also are reducing the revenue and the expense from last year of the um, COVID revenue and expenses we spent for last year of about $2.8 million. So our expenditures, we have a right sizing of staff. These are reductions in our expenses, administrative reductions, elementary deans. We're aligning those and utilizing the funding from achievement and integration to pay part of our elementary deans. Um, additional staffing aligned to achievement integration, about $170,000. That is an increase. Um, reassigning stipends and staff costs to staff development. That's a one-year change only, about $100,000. We are, as um, talked about, a substitute teacher pilot. We hired some monitors um, just recently or earlier in the meeting, so it's about a $15,000 savings and um, reduction in COVID-related expenditures, what I just had talked about as far as that's the offset to the revenue. COVID funding, we've talked about this. Um, funding that we've received last year, that's two point. Um, you know, it's a little almost $2.8 million. That's really doesn't, um, all the expenditures that we had to have for last year, um, just in cleaning supplies and additional um, tier one childcare, all those other things that we had to pay for with those funds in order to keep the district uh, moving forward. Um, and so overall, again, we're about $105 million and overall general fund, um, this is about, I would say, a little less under 3% of our total budget. And then for the future, we're looking at ESSER two funds for the current year. Like I said, that's about a half a percent of our budget. ESSER three funds, um, that can be spent until 2023. 20% um, of that, so about $307,000 has to be spent, spent, has to be spent on summer school and the remaining can be spent in other ways, um, especially to maintain our staffing and our programming. So we would be able to utilize that in the future for that purpose. But again, um, these are um, small numbers in, con in comparison to our total overall budget. And if we compare us with other districts, you can see we, got four, we received $40 um, in funding. We are the almost at the bottom of all public and charter schools. We're ranked 256 out of 476 um, charter and public schools. So we're receiving <coughs> the least amount of funding overall for school districts um, per pupil. We talked a little bit about these additional dollars. We received another 248,655. Um, this again is for summer school programming and bringing expanded mental health, um, partnering with community businesses and summer programming to our students. And we can spend this through August of next year. Um, and again, we just were notified of this in May. And then the extended learning programs, again, this is about another 50,000, 489, or um, excuse me, 195.6 for this. Um, Operating referendum comparisons, and we've talked about this. Our district is one of the lowest comparisons in, um, to those districts surrounding us and to others that we often are compared to. And the same with our technology. Um, with We don't have a technology levy as compared to some of our surrounding districts. And then again, our revenue comparison, I just want to reiterate that it continues to even though we passed an operating referendum in 2017, we did increase our number to our ranking to 241 and we're back down to 256 now, um, just because other districts are also passing those operating re um, <coughs> referendums. So overall, our general fund budget, um, our revenue is 105, um, 699, 781. Um, we are all over our estimated expenditures are 108, 641. Um, and so we are spending down a little bit of our fund balance, but we're still within our fund balance policy of 8 to 12 percent. We're a little about 8.5. Um, so overall, our budget um, is in a positive. All other funds, this is very similar to what you um, reviewed at the board work session. 
And this, the only thing that's changed is community service. Those numbers have varied a little bit. I knew that they were working, continue to work through their budget as after our last conversation. And so it has changed a little bit, but still in a very positive position for community education. So overall, our budget, um, I just want to point out, um, if we want to go through each of these, our food service budget is in a positive. Um, community education is um, really had been spent down simply because of COVID, and they're really working hard to bring that back to a positive area. Um, our building construction fund, we're done with that spending. Our total debt service, you can see that's for repaying our bonds. Our custodial fund is um, for any fundraisers for student activities. Our internal service fund, that is our health and dental um, um, self-insured, and it's specifically for that. And then our revocable trust, this one always looks very strange. It's a change with our audit, last auditors showing what we, uh, showing, it shows what we haven't um, reserved yet, but we do have assets of 8.2 or almost 8.3 million dollars um, what we're short that 3.6 million is really the implicit rate which we the district really doesn't need to um, raise those funds or save those funds and so we're not doing that but that also shows what we're short because of that reason but we do have funds available for this purpose and I just want to make sure people understand that any questions about the budget? Um, I'll ask one just as it relates to that. Um, sure. The OPEB. Um, revenues keeping up with expenditures? I mean, is there not a concern there? I mean, you know, I know it's... Well, we do have, as you know, we have limited and ended all of the other post-employment benefits in the district. So now they're current. We pay those current in our current budget. And so once that money runs out, we should be running out of anybody that's um, eligible for Before those it. funds. So the liability is going down. The liability the, is going down as well. The, yeah, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Mary. Um, I have three questions. One, could you explain the impact of the 4.5% in special education? Is, is, is that helping with the cross-subsidy, or is that just keeping up with the It's Jones really just is, keeping up, especially since hole. we went backwards this year. Okay. Um, is there Question. any thought of that actually getting any better? No. <laughs> Unless the legislature does something to help us with that, I really don't see that improving. Okay. Um, now, I know you explained what the custodial fund is, but we also have, you know, the fund 50 and, and other things for like, um, you know, for, for the student council fundraisers there or anything like that. Could you just explain the difference between what you talked about with the custodial fund being? So the custodial fund is really when we raise funds like pennies for patients okay. and it goes right into our coffers and right back out. Okay. So it's something like a flow through more so than anything else. Okay. For a specific fundraiser for student activity only. Thank you for qualifying mm -hmm. that. I know that they made that change, but it's always been kind of confusing yes. the, how we name it. it. <laughs> it's just kind of weird. Um, and then the other thing is, is that, um, you know, you had mentioned that the actual um, uh, uh, core formula, the base formula, uh, has has not risen at all it's actually shrunk uh but you know do we especially in light of our current circumstances are we eligible for any additional compensatory funds other than what's already out there that really is only based on the students that qualify for free or reduced lunch okay so that is really that's the only thing that that is based on. Yeah, and all districts get the same base formula. The rest of them get the compensatory. That's what makes up a large portion of the difference. Not, not necessarily. And that compensatory is for specific purposes for the educational component of those students who are disadvantaged. And so that is why that money goes to the more students that you have qualified and um, low social economic resources, they tend to have less um, preschool instruction. They have tend to have less 
really interaction with schools or learning before they attend kindergarten. So this is a way for them to catch up and get to that reading by third grade. What I'm trying to understand is that the, the general formula, every, we all start off on the same playing field and then it varies after that or do schools, districts actually get a different core base general formula allocation? Everyone gets the same base formula right. okay. and everyone really gets the same dollar per student for compensatory it's just how many students do you have that qualify for that okay. so it's really based again on <clears throat> qualification or enrollment in those and, and student demographics okay thank you mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was just going to say to follow up on that it did however impact the amount of um, government funds we got SRF. during COVID. The SRF funds. Yeah, absolutely. So we are not on a level playing field with other districts based on that. Right, that is correct. Thank you. Julie, what, what is our percentage right now? Like a free and reduced? It's around 12%. And that's been fairly, fairly stable. consistent. I was mm -hmm. gonna say that's pretty, it's between 12, 13. Right, it is fairly stable. For 10 years. And it's one of the lowest, and which is also why we received some of the lowest funding in the state because we aren't receiving that funding or very little. It's about $650,000 total between compensatory and EL. Oh, and EL, okay. Yeah, um, a question on um, enrollment. Um, you know, I know the trend that had been going on was a little bit different this year. I d just wanted to summarize the latest changes. Uh, did we still see reductions in elementary and the secondary is pretty much staying flat? Secondary staying flat. Our kindergarten is looking better. Okay. I will give some... Incoming um, kindergarten? Incoming or? kindergarten. <coughs> um, we're only about 10 students less than what we've been but in the last year at this time. Okay. And so um, that number is looking fairly positive. I'm hoping as we continue through the summer... Um, people know that we'll come back to school as normal when they see some additional student um, enrollment in the district. We do have a very high enrollment um, for summer school, um, K-12, really. And so that's a positive for people wanting that additional service. Okay. Good. Any other, yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Mary. I had a follow-up question on uh, what Stacy said about the free and reduced lunch. And, I, and again, this is... I, I know I didn't say this ahead of time or ever ask this ahead of time, but I remember listening to something, I think it was online, uh, like an online podcast or something like that on education where they actually said that when you look at the, no, the need for free and reduced lunch versus the number that apply, there's a significant percentage difference that then the schools also have to absorb. Um, and I was wondering if you had any idea how that applies to us. That has been typically people are one too proud to apply and so they don't or they feel like they can't um, apply and so many times they don't and that's where that more so comes from. I wouldn't have a percent or an idea off the top of my head. I would have to re research a little bit to see how that would and it's really I wouldn't know how many people didn't apply that typically would qualify for that service. Does it hurt us in any way? I mean, when we, because obviously we're not going to let a kid starve, you know, that sort of thing. So we have to, excuse the you know, bluntness of that, but he's laughed. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it's like when they don't apply, but we're still going to help the student. Um, Typically when we see something like that where students aren't eating or we will step in, our counselors will step in, or our social workers to have them apply so that we can make sure that those students get something to eat. We also have different angel, we call them angel funds here, but that we will help those students as well. Um, but you're right, if they aren't applying or their parents won't, then it does put a burden on the district. Thank you. Um, just along those lines, so with the program ending the free lunches and free rates through the summer. Like last year, we get it through the summer. This year, we're not, correct? We have it through the end of next year, K-8. Oh, we do, okay. But not for 9-12. Okay. So just, um, oh, I know, that's what you're saying, yeah. No, I'm, I'm saying the, we had a reduction in the amount of people applying for free and reduced because during COVID, <laughs> but now that is now rescinded, right? I mean, are, 
No. And that's what she it just only said. is. That is really. Oh, I didn't. I guess they I are continuing it through the end of next year. <clears throat> okay, so that's really not going to help our problem with people applying then. That is not. And you know when. The, actually, who saved that money is the state. They saved quite a bit well, yeah, of money right. not they paying out yep. compensatory funds to school districts. That was part of their savings when their the budget money they forecast. got from the feds. Is that it? no? Oh, the that money that they would have paid to school districts pay. yeah, if their students would funds. have <clears throat> applied. Okay, so they saved that money knowing yes. that the applications were down. Right. So that we would need it, but they're not. The state okay. is not responsible for that funding. The federal, the USDA is paying for that? No, no, they're saying they're the saving state. their state funding. It's the state funding. It's state, compensatory is state funding. Okay. So okay. the state saved right. the money that they would have paid out to school districts because parents didn't need to apply for that. Right. And so what they would have typically paid out actually was a savings to the state coffers and school districts lost that funding. Yeah, but when you think they would use it to go for districts that enrollment was down with lost enrollment? <laughs> because, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> we don't disagree. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm just saying it's a logical whatever connect, but okay. Yeah, but I'm also kind of worried about if, we, if the numbers go down, does that affect well, their planning and budget planning in future years, thinking right. that, you know, and then we're at a loss there too. I mean, I, that's that's concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that was my. I, yeah, I, I guess I forgot that we. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that we've been contacting our legis legislators mm -hmm. about. It's one of the things that we have been advocating for is um, reinstating those funds, um, reinstating the lost revenue because of COVID, lost enrollment because of COVID. We've advocated strongly with the legislature on those items, and it's. You know, they feel, as you've heard, that the federal COVID funding has made up for that. As you can see, in our school district, it certainly hasn't done that. We've, we've lost, you know. You had it last time in our board packet. Yeah, a I did million, have it in the board packet. It was packet. over $2 million. Right. And mm -hmm. just with, even if you take the ESSER, the extend, ex, right. um, expenditures, it was over $2 million. Right. Um, can, yeah. Go ahead. What? When we, um, so the, the, lunch pro or the food program that we had that you said is that exact same program is being st extended K through eight through next year. Because if the high school is not in the federal school right. lunch program. Got it. They will not be eligible for that. Are we, how, um, are we actually breaking even with that or are we yes. taking it? Okay. But we're also down significantly in the number of staff that we have this year. Yeah. So we need to bring those staff back for next year so we can serve lunch in the schools and, yeah. you know, instead of preparing those prepackaged lunches for students to oh, take home. Yeah. yeah. So we definitely need additional staffing. And, and so if anybody out there is interested in applying, <laughs> we have plenty of openings. Okay. 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 Any other questions <coughs> as far as um, forward, steps forward? So this isn't for acceptance it's for next right or no it's for this board meeting we need to approve the budget what well, says this board will take oh sorry i read the wrong line i was reading the text thing the board okay needs to approve it sorry i was reading the wrong line got a little mm -hmm. switchy okay so we need to um have a motion here in a second do i have a motion to approve so made by enrique second, second. by mary any other comments and questions seeing none all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7-0. Okay, and next up is tech levy proposal. I'll go ahead and start that one. And uh, first of all, Julie, thank you for that. I think I think the we actually did reverse. We had the tech levy presentation first, and we switched it um, this tonight. And I think it was really important for you to get the full context of where we've been, where we are with our budget as we now consider um, the technology proposal in front of you. So thanks so much for doing that. Uh, as you directed us on May 24th, we are coming forward this evening with a technology level proposal 
Recommendation and uh, Executive Director of Business Services, Julie Sink, and Director of Technology, Marcus Malazzo, will be uh, co-leading this uh, presentation as we move forward. And tonight we'll be looking for your input and continued direction as we then uh, plan to bring forward, as you had directed on July 12th, um, approve our board action on this. So just really briefly an overview of this. Uh, again, you just heard a, a lot of our um, budget context, but in addition to that, we'll share a little bit more about funding. Um, you'll hear some of the input uh, and the themes that emerged from that from our stakeholders into the recommendation um, and some of that impact, uh, depending on what happens, um, if the levy would be successful or if not. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over <laughs> to Julie. Thanks, Julie, who will be leading the funding portion of this presentation. So this is the really the slide that I should have been presenting as I was talking about the 70%. Um, the state funding hasn't kept up with inflation. Um, you know, if we would have received the funding at the $7,070 per pupil, we're looking at about $5 million in additional funding for our district. And so you can see that's kind of where, we, where our need is at. And so we know that um, since 2003, Funding hasn't kept pace, and so we're constantly, you know, I would say behind the eight ball a little bit in trying to catch up and finding ways to be more streamlined and offering our students the best education possible. Our budget adjustments for the past couple of years, last year was $3 million. On the current year, we made $2 million in adjustments. We anticipate another $2 million in budget adjustments for next year. Um, we do have an annual technology levy. We looked at that a little bit at the last um, presentation, but again, you can see um, some of our surrounding school districts, Lakesville, Burnsville, Shakopee, um, they definitely have technology levies to help their districts. Um, and even Eastern Carver County, which is close to us, if you look at um, other districts that we are often compared to, like Dinah, Rosemont, Napa Valley, Egan, Minnetonka, Wyzetta, they have significant um, amounts of money and even Edina I believe that this is their old number because it's based on the current there I think they're getting an, um, a total of seven million dollars in funding um, our combined technology budget this is the current um, uh, you can see our overall budget is 4.5 million dollars but of that 851,000 um, was used from the COVID funds to help make sure that we could in, have students have um, working one-to-one -one, um, devices in their hands during this time. And so um, we certainly, when we started um, the one-to-one, 8-12 in 2015, we knew back then that we didn't have a sustainable funding source for this. Um, we've continued to utilize general fund dollars for our technology needs. Um, it really is starting to strain the budget simply because we don't have a funding source for technology, even though really this last year we were pretty much required to have one-to-one -one computers for our students. And so um, I believe if I do this, you can see overall budget. Without that, it's really about $3.5 million in the technology budget. We do have about $200,000 of e-content subscriptions and another $65,000 in assessments that um, we use for um, technology purposes. Um, this is, we do, um, did receive, um, we talked about that $4.5 million in federal and state relief, but that $4.5 million is really um, funding that we just have a receipt, so we couldn't have used it for last year. And some of it is very restricted for summer school and other items. And so um, even though we did receive those funds, they were very restricted, so we had about $8.8 .8 .8 million in estimated costs and revenue losses for student enrollment. Um, so you can see we have a deficit overall. Um, but that's just one year, and so you have to be you know, the COVID funds are over really three years of, um, of relief. And so it's really going to be difficult for us to, you know, we're comparing this and it's a great way to do a comparison over one year, but really that's a three year um, revenue source. 
um, five-year technology budget um, for the Department of Technology. And you can see um, in 2015, 16, we were right at that 2.9 million, to, you know, right around the $3 million mark for three years, and all of a sudden it jumped up, and that's when we uh, made the decision to have laptops for our teaching staff. Um, and each year we do allow um, the technology budget what they haven't spent to carry over and so you can see those adjustments because these are their final budgets every year and so you can um, that's why there's some variance there so it really depends on what those needs were for the prior year it does help them to be able to carry those funds over if they uh, haven't spent it for some reason so we definitely have that three and a half million dollars of um, budgeted costs um, for technology um, when we look at what the technology um, levy would help us to do, it's um, a funding source to sustain and enhance our technology offerings. Um, if it's voter approved, we would have a $3.5 million tech levy. We'd reduce the amount of funding for the general fund. It says a plus, but it's, we are funding it at $3.5 million now. We would fund $2 million of it out of the general fund. So for a total of $5.5 million, and then that other $1.5 million would be relief to the um, general fund. I hope that people understand that. So we would add $3.5 million in the technology levy specifically for technology. We'd reduce the amount of funding out of the general fund from 3.5 to 2 for a total of 5.5. So it actually relieves the general fund about a million and a half dollars per year. Thank you. <laughs> so the levy proposal, um, the tax impact, um, we know about the average home in Prior Lake Savage Area Schools is about $400,000, $397,820 to be exact. Um, this would be a $3.5 million per year for 10 years. It's about $17 a month, it's 16.67. <laughs> so we rounded it up to $17 a month. Um, there has been some discussion as to what would it be if we said it was a $3 million technology levy or a $4 million technology levy. At the $400,000 um, average home price, it's about a $28.50. Um, either at $3.5 million, $3 million, you'd reduce the total cost by $28.50 a year. If you went to $4 million, you'd increase it $28.50. So instead of $17 a month, it looked like $15 a month at $3 million or $19 a month at $4 million. So I'm just giving you a little bit of education on either side of that $3.5 million. So it's about a $2 per month swing, one way or the other. <laughs> okay. Dr. Stallo, members of the board, good evening. My name is Marcus Malazzo. I'm the director of technology for Prior Lake Savage Area Schools. This is my portion of the presentation where I'll lead you through some of the key themes and recommendations. Um, we've listened to our stakeholders and this is a slide where we've conducted student and staff surveys in the fall and student focus groups in the spring. Um, we heard from Peter earlier tonight about the stakeholder or the family uh, survey. And then we surveyed staff and students again. Uh, we've received administration feedback. Um, we've presented to FLIRP, our facilities, finance and long range planning. And we've also had a meeting with meet and confer. The key themes that came out of all that uh, feedback, students, what they said they need to be able to do is maximize screen real estate, be able to write on a screen, have a backward facing camera, have more apps, have faster loading speeds, and a physical keyboard. If you look at what staff put down and what we summarized, it's very similar. Maximize screen real estate, being able to write on a screen is beneficial, having a backward facing camera, Troubleshooting the student device issues, so having a like device so that they are able to troubleshoot what the students are going through. And then seeing how students view websites and apps as well. So again, having a like device where they can go through the same apps or websites and see how those apps react to, on that device. So very similar themes. We're gonna revisit the slide here a little bit later. 
Again, you heard this earlier uh, tonight from Peter. 89% of our parents, or 82% of our residents say our community receives a good value from its investment in our schools. And 88% of our parents, or 80% of our residents, say they are proud of our <coughs> schools and would recommend them to a friend. Those are great numbers. Moving on to how important technology is for students. As parents said 60% is absolutely essential. Residents, um, 53%. <coughs> Excuse me. 29% of parents said it was very important, and 37% uh, of residents said it was very important. How would you rate technology opportunities for the students? Parents said 34% said it was excellent. Residents said 24% was excellent. 57% of parents said it was good, and 52% residents said it was good. Those are numbers I want to focus on, and I want to get those good to excellent. Uh, I think that's really, really important that, okay, we'll, we'll take the excellent, but we need to really increase that. We want those goods to become excellent, and a potential technology is one way of doing that. So here are some of the recommendations. So you've seen this before. Our areas of focus was four. Now it's five because we broke out safety and security. As you heard earlier, Peter saying how important that is to break that out, and so we did. Um, our areas of focus are uh, a dedicated uh, source of technology funding would free up money in the general fund for other student and classroom needs. Technology funds would be used in the following areas of focus. Student and staff devices, safety and security, classroom learning, network infrastructure and operational software, and technology support. And going back to those themes, uh, when we're talking about jumping ahead to types of devices we had, we're, what we're trying to do is check all the boxes. So if we're looking at, when we start getting granular and start looking at devices, it's my job, and, and with feedback from others on the admin team, and then taking all the feedback we receive from our stakeholders to round out what type of devices we would be going forward. If a you know if we, the board approves the tech levy and, and it's voter approved, then the conversation is what devices checks all the boxes. So we I'm happy to have those conversations. We as you know I've been doing my due diligence and checking with leasing vendors what current pricing is and what interest rates are at and what type of terms they offer. We've w reached out to vendors and talked uh, to them what current pricing is and what we can do on a per model basis. So we're doing that work, but you won't see that tonight in the presentation. And so we can, at the, the comment or question area, we can discuss that further if you'd like. So just to recap, you've seen this screen before, uh, the slide before, what we were doing in 1920 versus 2021. So again, 812, one to one, 1920, and then the cart model uh, of iPads K through seven. And then we had uh, shared Chromebook carts K12. 2021 comes along and we're now a K through 12 one-to-one -one district, and with, <clears throat> excuse me, with two and five, grades two through five having uh, Chromebooks because we ran out of iPads. So going back to those areas of focus and how the funds would be used, I'm gonna break down each of those five areas and, and speak to those. The first is student and staff devices. We're always gonna put the students first. You'll always hear me say that because that's where they need to be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, how funds would be used in regards to student and staff devices, it would provide equitable access to instructional technology for all of our students and staff. Our current inventory does not meet our needs of all of our students and staff. And you've heard the complaints, no physical keyboards, no backward facing camera, all those areas of key areas of themes that we talked about, that's what they're referring to. Some of our, you know, we're through ESSER funds and we are able to upgrade iPads grades uh, six, seven and eight this past fall but we still have outdated technology out there in the hands of students that we'd like to replace. Uh, tech levy would allow all K-12 students to maintain district issued devices that better serves their learning needs in classrooms at, and at home. Again, what Peter referenced earlier, it's how technology impacts the classroom learning. So when we talk about anytime, anywhere learning, that's in the classroom, in the school, uh, after school, it is the ability to break out in small groups and collaborate, reaching out to a teacher if you have a question after class is over. The ability to take that technology <coughs> and leverage it for instructional uh, needs is what we're talking about. Not, uh, we're gonna continue distance or hybrid learning. It's not what we're talking about. It's how it impacts instructional excellence in our buildings and our classrooms. Um, a tech levy would allow all staff to have district issued devices that meets their needs in, in the classroom or department. So 
would help our staff as well. And really important, the last bullet is a tech levy would provide a four-year replacement cycle. Right now, it's, we're doing our best with replacement cycles, but it's really hard to do it when you don't have a sustainable funding mechanism. And there's times where we try to get as the biggest return on our investment on our devices. When you do that, sometimes you have an iPad mini out there that's seven or eight years old, and you've heard me speak to that and talk about that. And we're trying to get those out of our inventory, but you do what you have to. How funds would be used in regards to safety and security? Again, a key point Peter brought up is that that's important to people, that our schools are safe and people feel secure within them. Um, this key impact statement is that additional funds would be allowed to the district to maintain and improve safety and security features in our buildings. Now, we have a lot of great safety and security measures in our buildings, so not only would we want to sustain but enhance those services, um, in these areas. Additional sur surveillance cameras uh, to create a safe environment for our students and staff. There are times where we, we are called upon to do a review and we don't have a great camera angle or no camera at that site and, and that spot. So it's, you know, we want to eliminate that response as much as possible is that we've got cameras everywhere. We have a lot of cameras, but there's opportunity for, cam the, for growth and coverage. In addition to, you add more cameras, you need more server space to record all that information so that you have a lo lo larger ret retention window instead of just five days. You know, you want to expand that out to two weeks, four weeks. So more cameras you add, more recording it's, there's taking place, so you need more server space to, to document and archive all that footage before it writes over itself. Um, maintain and enhance door entries and building alarm systems. So whether you're using your key fob, are there security measures? Uh, there's always ways to improve that and tie that in with the existing system. So we would look to do that. Again, sustain and, and enhance. Increase radio inventory. So we have a number of radios out there right now. It's a new system for us, but we'd like to expand that and do a phase two of that. Um, and then it, also to improve our school safety emergency communication capabilities. There's all kinds of communication programs out there that we don't have. We have School Messenger and we have some tools that we can send out mass communications, but there's other services that get more granular in what you can do and what type of message you can send out. So we would, if voter approved, a tech levy is voter approved, we would uh, look at those options as well. And then we would maintain our visitor management system uh, to ID visitors. That's our Raptor system that you've probably used as you've come into our buildings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next area of focus is classroom learning. Our impact statement is to provide flexibility and adaptability for emerging technologies to make learning more personalized, purposeful, and empowered for E12 students. That ties back to that Laker Learning Compass that you've seen me present and speak to before. Instructional software and hardware, digital curriculum and resources, classroom, audio, and video. That's a huge piece of this, is that we have a large inventory of smart boards that are 10 plus years old. And they're, they're still working, but um, as we build, as we've built new additions and new, actual new buildings, uh, we've gone away from smart boards and gone more towards laser projectors that have the touch capability, longer, that last a whole lot longer, much more updated software. Um, we also incorporated monitors is a great way to also share that screen real estate without having the overhead cost of something like a smart board. And then you tie something like an Apple TV and a, a mixer into all that. There's lots of ways that you can share and maximize that screen real estate. And so instead of just one smart board with one projector and the ceiling shining on it, there's new ways of doing that and replacing those systems would be paramount. Um, that digital family communication, um, you know, making sure that families feel connected and are updated on a frequent basis is huge. And then those things like our student information system and learning platforms, Infinite Campus, Schoology, and Seesaw, huge ways to communicate to our stakeholders and give the parents a view of the classroom from, is pretty granular if you want to be. It's really, it gives you a lot of opportunities to drill down and, and see what's going on in the classroom in regards to your, your, your family members. So, my, one of my faves, but it's, uh, it's all the stuff behind the curtain, is network infrastructure and operational software. Again, the key impact statement is keeps critical infrastructure system running safely and efficiently. We always say if your backbone isn't strong, if it's not up to date, if you don't have those systems in place, everything on the edge will not work. So it's really important for the IT department to make sure that we have these things updated and um, as current as possible. So things like the voice over IP, phone system, that is due for an upgrade, so that would be included. That would be a priority number one. 
network switches we just upgraded, but we'd want to get those on a replacement plan, four to five year cycle. Wireless access points, I believe our current Arubas are end of sale 2026, 20, so something where you want to look at uh, getting updated and also have reap the benefits of Wi-Fi 6. If we have devices that can handle it, we want the APs to be able to push it. So um, get that, get this infrastructure equipment on an uh, update cycle as well. Then we got HVAC heating, ventilation, air conditioning controls, um, whether it's um, Siemens or Yules, um, a lot of that server base, and we want to make sure that's current and running on on up-to-date hardware and that that software is running correctly. And then employment data systems, that's the finance and HR. So that's things like Skyward and Frontline and all these other systems that we're using for um, uh, finance and human resources. Tech support, our impact statement is allowing for additional staffing to help students and staff with digital devices, troubleshooting repairs and provide staff training in using new technologies. So we would be asking for additional staffing to support, enhance the learning and technology, and along with that professional de development for this, um, every staff member that has a device issued by the district. You've seen these slides before. This is our comparisons um, for our staff to student ratios. This was 2019-2020, and we we're at a one to 599. We did get updated numbers. We added a couple districts. And unfortunately, we're still at the bottom of this ratio. So <coughs> it got worse as far as our ratio goes. But we show up to work every day with smiles on our faces to here to support all of our stakeholders, regardless of the ratio. Okay, that's our job. This is the uh, ballot language. This is a draft that I believe this was submitted by legal. Um, so this is their wording. Um, I'm not going to read all that. I'm just going to put it up on the screen and know that this is a draft and I believe that it is a work in progress, but maybe the, the board will have a conversation about the wording and, and the language at a later date. Election impact. What is if a proposed tech levy passes in November? Well, student and staff devices. All students and staff would have equitable access to instructional tech. This would, would and a really important part, and I want to keep stating that we would be able to facilitate a four-year device replacement cycle. So if the board decides to go out for a tech levy, and one of those, you know, the marketing campaign, and one of those things that is, I think, along with school safety and security, um, the ability to have a updated device in the hands of a student that can meet their needs currently where they're at and as they grow and, and move through our district, but then also have that device, whatever that device may be, be updated in a four-year cycle so that in a 10-year tech levy, those students would have three refreshes of devices, I think is really huge and really, really important. If you want to stay current, if you want to be competitive, if you want to have students have the best opportunities for any time, anywhere learning, that's really important. Safety and security. Uh, probably like Savage Area Schools would have funding to sustain and enhance school safety and security. We talked about that. And support a crisis management plan, which is... Uh, an amazing plan and it continues to evolve and grow and the people that are in charge of that are doing a wonderful job so our we want to make sure that we're giving them all the tools necessary to help support that plan classroom learning teachers would have access to instructional software and hardware digital curriculum and resources <coughs> excuse me teachers and students would be able to continue to have access to classroom a av equipment spoke to that earlier updated av equipment would be it would be a refresh and a replacement cycle getting rid of those old smart boards and adding new technology into classrooms that would give teachers and students the ability to have more screen real estate. Huge deal. Student information systems with, and learning platforms would be maintained. Infinite Campus School G C saw, which are very, Infinite Campus is our SIS. It's where it's, it's all of our grades are, are housed. And, um, and then School G C saw are our learning management software and they're very, very popular with students and staff. Network infrastructure and operational software. We would have uh, sustainable funding over 10 years to acquire and maintain infrastructure that does support all these tech initiatives. And I spoke to that earlier. Why well, I feel how you know that's so important. Tech support. We would have hopefully adequate staffing, more so than our current ratios, to support the student learning. All these devices that would be, and all this classroom AV equipment and all the instructional software. <clears throat> and then also to continue uh, PD for teachers to help maximize the technology investment. 
in the classroom. What if a pre uh, proposed tech levy fails in November? This is not a slide that I'm happy to go over, but I'm going to because it is really important to know if we don't go out for a tech levy or if it does fail, things are going to be different in how we deliver instructional technology in this district. So for the sake of transparency and so that everyone's aware on what could and will happen if this does not pass, if we don't go out or if it does not pass, these things would happen. Student staff devices, we would have to reduce the student district issued devices from a, our current K-12 and go to a 9-12 solution, which is a step back from where we were pre-pandemic when we were 8-12. And that would start in 22-23. Um, the Chromebooks aren't lasting. Um, they are, the break fix on those is through the roof and they, just the build quality, I'm not trying to rip on Chromebooks, but that is our reality is that they are not in our current deployment, they are the number one device that we are constantly upgrading, fixing. And so the break fix is through the roof on those. So we would have to scale back our offerings on, on what we do for one-to-one. -one. Limited shared devices would be only available in grades K through eight. So unfortunately, we'd go back to a cart model. And I don't think it would be as a robust cart model as it was pre-pandemic. Um, again, we're only gonna have limited number of devices they have to go back in carts. We don't have enough for a two to one or a three to one. It would be a cart model at those grade levels. And why it would be a, that model <clears throat> is because um, we have the carts that we were so we reuse them. So get return on the investment. We didn't scrap those carts. They're still available. So we would reuse them. Um, try to do it in an equitable way, whether it's grade level or department and create a rotation or a schedule. But we also don't have a lot of wired labs anymore either. So when you're, you're talking about testing sessions coming up or you're talking about just access to the technology, <clears throat> excuse me, there's really no other way to do this at these grade levels besides the cart model. And it would be limited compared to what we had in the past. We wouldn't have 30 Chromebook carts at the high school. Um, we would need to further reduce the amount of devices we have our all dis staff district wide. Currently, most staff have a MacBook Air and a desktop PC in their classrooms. Not all, because Hamilton Ridge and ALC don't have desktops in the classrooms. But we would have to reduce that. We'd have to probably go down to one device, whether that's the MacBook Air or the desktop, to be determined. Um, the aging AV equipment, like the smart boards, which I mentioned earlier, would, would not be updated or replaced. We would just continue to <coughs> hopefully keep them running and keep the lights on. Safety and security, um, we would not add equipment. We would just support what we currently have. We would, for classroom learning, we would um, postpone any new curriculum adoption. Network infrastructure and operational software. <clears throat> Only the absolute mission critical updates to the network infrastructure. Thank you. It's very kind. I'm gonna leverage that right now. Thank you. <laughs> You know, summer cold, so. They're back. I'm back. Thank you. It's a little warm in here, too. I should call somebody about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Just, just text him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fine. I know. <laughs> We're on classroom learning. We would need to postpone any new curriculum adoption. We just wouldn't have the funds to go with something new. Uh, network infrastructure and operational software. Only mission critical updates to the network infrastructure would be completed. So end of life, end of sale, end of support switches or equipment would be updated. We would let, we continue to leverage E-Rate to do that because that's how we do it currently. Um, you know, it was interesting what I heard earlier about our free and reduced counts and how that impacts a lot of our services that we provide. When we apply for something in E-Rate that's based off of free, our free and reduced launch counts, our discounts, 40% E-rate, and you, you compare that to other districts that are getting 50, 60, 70% discount, E-rate discounts. It's, again, it's another example of where, just where we're at. Tech support, I would, I would advocate that we, uh, that our staffing levels would remain static. We're small as it is, but, um, you know, we would have to look at everything. 
that's how I'm going to phrase that. There would be an additional financial burden to the general fund that would prohibit us from being able to free up money in the budget or other for other student classroom needs, resulting in continued budget. So that benefit of that $1.5 million in savings each year that goes on for 10 years, that's gone. Some of the, all this money would still have to come out to do this would have to come out of the general. So there's no relief there. And while you're reviewing this timeline of all the presentations we did, I'm going to do this. So we did start this so almost a year ago. And you'll see all the board uh, presentations we've made. Uh, the FLIRP meetings are in there. More board members meet and confer. And we're here tonight on June 14th. And here is a visual representation. If you're a visual learner like me, this is a nice timeline for that. Summary. A dedicated source of technology funding would free up money in the general fund for other students and classroom needs. While we are grateful for any additional state funding, for nearly two decades, state funding has not kept pace with inflation or increased educational costs. Critical state mandated programs to support student needs costs to the district millions more than it receives each year, putting additional pressure on the district's general fund budget. Uh, my budget, my department, and what we do is a good example of that. Uh, it's critical. We need to have it, but it does put a strain on the general fund. And as you know, we're one of the only neighboring, uh, one of the few neighboring and comparable districts without a tech levy. We have made $5 million in budget adjustments in the past two school years, and we anticipate another $2 million in adjustments in, in the years ahead. So as we forecast, we're looking at another $2 million in adjustments. The federal COVID relief dollars are one-time funds, and we're super thrilled to have them, and we appreciate them, but the key is they're one-time funds. We get them at a different level than all of our neighbors. They're not ongoing. They're not sustainable, so we can't count on them moving forward. We had nearly $9 million in COVID-related costs. We received about half of that from the state and federal funds to cover them. That leaves us with a more than $4 million COVID-related deficit. We are in the bottom 5% of all Minnesota school districts and charter schools in the amount of federal COVID relief dollars per student that we have received. So our summary and our recommendations is a $3.5 million uh, for a 10 year, per year for 10 years for technology levy request on November 2nd on the 2021 ballot. The tax impact would be $17 a month based on the district's 400,000 average home value. The funds again would support those areas of focus which are student and staff devices, safety and security, classroom learning, network infrastructure and operational software, and technology support. We're at that point in the presentation where I can answer any and all of your questions. All right. <clears throat> Let's go. Who's got questions? Jonathan. I have plenty. Uh, you mentioned, I don't know if this is for you or somebody else, Marcus, but you did mention the um, meet and confer that happened in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about um, outcome from that or the input that was received, feedback. Uh, great meeting. It was, um, it was at the end of the year, so it was a little smaller attendance-wise, and that's, that's just the reality of it. But I uh, do it. Oh, sorry. Jonathan was there, right? No. No, you no, were Flirt. Oh, flirt. Not flirt. Oh, I thought you said flirt. Okay, sorry. Meet and Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it was a productive meeting. I got really good feedback. I did ask a question about desktops versus laptops and how is that meeting their needs. Um, you know, so I asked for some feedback and re regarding to staff devices currently available. Um, just uh, yeah, it was a good meeting, um, and some of the feedback that we got from that meeting was incorporated in today's presentation. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's always a good, you know, good opportunity to sit down and hear from from the union and their members on on what they went through, what they lived, and and what we're doing and how it impacts their day to day. So it was a good meeting. Good, good. Um, confirm for me. I had some conversations earlier today 
um, trying to work through this in my own mind. Uh, we have had roughly a three and a half million dollar budget for your world the past several years. Okay. Increased this year with one-time funds that were spent mostly on devices and things directly related to the pandemic. Um, as we've talked about this, I've frequently said I, the 3.5 number to me was appropriate because it was roughly what our budget was for technology. And if we're finding a dedicated funding source, those two numbers made sense to me. We're now sort of saying <clears throat> with passage, we'd actually likely have a budget for your world that would go up considerably because mm -hmm. we were talking about that roughly 5.5. I think what I have grasped now is really the biggest reason that's going to be a different number because this enables us to get into a life cycle management rotation with replacing of devices and the, the new expenditures because it looks to me like we're increasing that portion of the budget. Um, <clears throat> we are alleviating some from general funds, but can you, can you speak to kind of we're going from what we used to look at as a 3.5 to 4 number to that 5.5. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So if we look at, if I can find the slide here. Because we're now a K-12 one-to-one district, mm -hmm. the, do the dollar is allocated if a tech levy is approved, if the, the board decides to go for a tech levy and it's voter approved, that number would increase to... If we're looking at a 5.5, that could be $1.5 million a, a year okay. in, you know, allocation towards student and staff devices. Now, that's prelim numbers, and I'm, mm -hmm. please don't hold me to them, but if we're, you're looking at how that would go from 3.5 to 5.5, mm -hmm. 1.5 would be dedicated towards student and staff devices so that we're on the, we, ha we can have enough devices, the right devices, that does check all the boxes. K-12, include, which includes staff, and also address the desktop question that's out there in the classrooms. Safety and security, you can allocate a dollar to that amount if it's, again, these are numbers that are pre prelim, but $500,000 to sustain and enhance what we're currently doing, I think is reasonable. You know, again, depending on what we're looking at to sustain and or enhance. Classroom learning would be a $1.5 million focus. Can I step in on that one for a minute? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really important, so I'm, I'm, what, what I also want to remind you is maybe not all of that 5.5 million would be oversight in Marcus's budget. Sure. The curriculum area yes. especially yep. is the place that I think Jeff and Kevin have said that that budget for curriculum has been maintained for the last 10 or 12 years. Well, we know what's changed in the last 10 and 12 years in terms of e-curriculum and resources um, and subscriptions and needs. So I just want to be clear that some, though that may not be that Marcus's complete budget would include that 5.5 million, but there would be um, significantly more dollars for classroom sure. learning in part because of curriculum yep. needs that we just have not been able to keep up with. Sorry for interrupting, oh, but I want to Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. I appreciate it. Um, network infrastructure and operational software, another 500000 yeah. potentially. And then tech support, if we're at 1.3 right now, all we, those add, devices. we add two FTEs, then we're at that 1.5, and that yeah. gets us to 5.5. Okay. Okay. Um, my last question, and I'll let somebody else in. Um, if you go to a life cycle management for, I don't know if that's the correct terminology, it's not my world, but with, with devices and a, and a regular routine of replacement, um, how, involved, um, how involved are your vendors? It seems, to, it seems to me like they'd be bending over backwards um, to, you know, they'd be lining up at your door wanting to talk to you and kind of help create that model. How, how, how much do you leverage them? Um, do you view them as partners, or we look at them as as yeah. guys trying to sell you something? Both. <laughs> 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 no, they're not. well. It's true. They're both. I mean, they're trying yeah. to sell something, yeah. but um, some vendors do a tremendous job of uh, helping with that return on the investment and making things easy for when you go back to um, to refresh and go. So, like our certain leasing vendors will say. 
we'll help you, we'll take the products back, we'll inventory them, we'll give you a complete list, we'll grade out each device, and then we'll resell them for you. It just depends on which agreement you look at and sign, but they, most of our vendors are really helpful on that complete life cycle, and they, because that's a selling point for them. Yeah. So if, if sure. they do a great job of that complete life cycle from, you know, to acquire, to help you maintain, whether they just do something or get out of the way while we're maintaining them through our, you know, jam systems or something else, you know, we have products for that. But, but then to close that life cycle loop and get them back out of our inventory and then start it over again, it's a big selling point for them. So they're helpful. We leverage them as much as we can. And um, there is a value there. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just to piggyback on the overall understanding of the finances there in terms of your budget, also am I correct in understanding that that budget for the last few years was funding an, an 8, 12, one-to-one -one device. With one-time funding, we were able to enhance what we needed to do for COVID with one-time funding. Yes. We're saying if we don't have the additional funding, there's no way you can go from 8, 12 to K, 12 and maintain that, much less make it any better because we were swapping out the old, you know, whatever device we could use. So, so that jump is partially what we were thrown into, and, and what we're looking at is pulling and going to just 912 going forward, because we don't have any more of those COVID funds. Those were to get us going. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. So that is a huge need for a change in that budget. And then if I'm understanding correctly, um, what we are saying we need right now kind of as a base to maintain and perhaps enhance that going forward is 5.5, mm -hmm. right? And so we're not saying let's go to the community for 5.5. Let's say let's ask them to part, you know, kind of partner with us, help us with the 3.5. We still have that balance that is money that will come out of the general fund, and we will see some relief in our general fund, and we're still looking at budget cuts in our general fund. So it's not even wiping out, not being able to keep up with state funding, et cetera, but that's giving us breathing room to do that. Um, and then, um, so I'm understanding that correctly. Is that right? So it's yes. still, yep. Okay. Thank you for your patience with me trying to figure all the money out. Um, and then I just wanted to make a few comments. I want to thank you for emphasizing putting, putting the students front and center. I feel like that drives everything. And that gets, when you're talking about technology, it's easy to lose focus on students. And um, from us all being in the classrooms, I think we have seen some of the incredible projects that our staff have done with students. Um, the way that the students are performing and growing and developing and they're all able to personalize their learning, but also their collaborative work. Um, so I just want to thank you for reminding us we're not talking machines, we're talking about learning. We're talking about students um, and our staff. Um, and then I would just say, um, to underscore the safety and security, I, I had the benefit this year of sitting in on a few of our bigger safety training sessions. Um, participating in the I Love You Guys Foundation that brings together people who have gone through school shootings or other disasters and the need for security and also some of our own internal crisis reunification issues. And um, there are needs there. And yes, we are a safe and secure school, but there's a lot we can do um, to, to help make us even more safe and secure. Um, so yeah, those are my main comments I wanted to make, and I want to make sure I understood the money issues. So thank you. Thank you. Mary, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, I just want to clarify something to make sure that everyone, uh, we're all on the same page, because, um, and I do totally agree with the safety and security piece, but we are getting um, um, the safety levy funds that pay for school resource officers, some of the security cameras, et cetera but we're responsible for the maintenance of those going forward. There are one-time purchase, and hopefully that will also become evergreen in the legislature to keep up at least, again, the status quo. Um, but um, I just wanted to ask, is, is, is there a, are we gonna go above and beyond uh, in the spend that we currently allocate that, those funds for in the, um, Safety, school safety uh, levy of money that we do get. Are we going to Julie. add on to that? I'm going. Can you help with that, Jim? Yeah. Good evening, Chair Wall. Um, 
board, Dr. Salo. Mary, not all of the money that we get out of safe schools funds our safety, um, cameras, um, door security. I'm not sure what that budget is, but it's, um, we've leveraged very little of that for, um, a lot of it comes out of capital, um, principal's capital, my capital. Okay. Um, so it's, it, and it's actually a response to a need and um, we do our best to maintain it too. I it's just only wasn't about sure $350,000, which our SRO officers come out of. Um, right. We have other Raptor, all of those things that we're trying to. It's just not sufficient to be able to do all the things you need to do with cameras, storage for all of the yeah. time, all of those things. It's just simply not enough. Radios. I thought we were paying Raptor out of the general fund. I didn't even know that was coming out. Well, when we have some funding, you know, we would try and utilize okay. that instead of the general fund, but um, it just really depends on what the need is every year. So if there isn't a need for cameras and we were able to take that out of construction, we may have had room for Raptor, but not every year. Right. You know, so we're trying to utilize those funds the best way that we can. Okay, and we're still, I mean, even if we get a one-time purchase, if we do purchase equipment, then we're responsible for the follow-on maintenance, we're responsible yeah. for the placement of that. And we have, as far as I know, I know they're going for the continuation of those funds, but there's no guarantee, so we'd be on the hook for that. Um, and I just wanted to clear the air on that one because I can, I can hear people asking that in the community and going, hey, wait a minute. Um, so first of all, um, you know, obviously technology underlies a lot of things that happen in the schools. Um, but again, um, and, and you know, and I've, I've looked over the numbers and how we spend it and stuff like that. And um, I know some things get put into the technology budget that most lay people wouldn't consider to be technology. And I am a technology person. Sometimes I don't consider them to be technology either, but that's where they end up. I do want to talk about the delta of what is going to happen if we get these funds. First of all, we are going to relieve the general fund by a certain percentage. But uh, if I go down my list here, the first thing is, is you are grossly understaffed. Um, what is the anticipation in that area for your staff? Do you have an ideal ratio? Do you have an ideal uh, percentage? Didn't you say two people? An additional two people? Yeah, just two people. I did. Uh, did. I'm just going to yeah. go back to that. Oh. I don't want to be at the bottom anymore. <laughs> so, that actually yeah. won't raise you that much. No, you too much yeah. <laughs> but um, with an additional two FT, because we lived a K-12 one-to-one with two individuals responsible for all those devices this year. So we lived it. Um, we don't want to continue to live it if we don't have to at that, at these ratios. So an additional two FT, I think, would be a really good start. I think that's where we, that's where we want to, be at moving forward okay. we're a small team we have always been a small team um, and and job roles have changed over time too it's, it used to be a lot of level one to tech support on, boots on the ground in the in the classrooms fixing smart boards and, right. and we still do some of that but as we up you know as we try to replace equipment and we the pedagogy shifts and we do other things that uh, the jobs change too so a lot of it especially when we went k-12 one-to-one the majority of that was on mobile device support. Not only the devices themselves, but the teachers teaching in a new way over these new tools that we had available and helping the parents at home because they're like, hey, we have to use these tools. We don't know how to do it. Please help. Of course, we're going to help. That's what we're here for. But that's, I'd like to see this ratio change for the, the positive, for the better for us. So starting with two would be a, a great start. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, and then also, now we made one-time investments. We purchased uh, a lot of the new equipment that we passed out this year, some mm -hmm. of it with CARES funds, some of it not, but still we, we were able to do that. Um, are we going to have the opportunity to, if, if we needed to go to and, and get that plan together to get uh, either 8 through 12 or 6 through 12 on, on MacBook Airs or laptops that we talked about almost a year ago now, <coughs> Uh, would we be able to actually push those back into those devices back into a lease and get some money back for them? Or how do we have a plan for that going forward? Uh, we have some options. Um, 
resale would be one of the, one of the that I would definitely look at if if board decides to go out for a tech levy, voters approve it. That those those iPads for grades six, seven, and eight, they'd be what two, three years old at that point. So, um, you know, resale. I would I would pursue and look at resale of those devices and see how we could leverage those because those, to your point, they were purchased, <laughs> they're not leased. So, right. But yeah, we would look to probably resell those so that everybody's, you know, as we go through these four year replacement cycles, everybody, at least the K through 12 students are on a similar device, depending on what options we go with. Um, you know, they'd be a like device, but I would, I would propose a resale of those iPads. Okay, because I know that when we originally budgeted for this before COVID and all that, we were talking about that leasing, and so we mm -hmm. had a managed cash flow, mm -hmm. um, and it made what we could do with that seem greater, and now that we're owning the devices and maintaining them and paying for the software on them and stuff like that, the, the, the ratios, the algorithm has shifted a little bit mm -hmm. and not necessarily in our favor. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, you were thinking about that and we had a plan on how to do that. The other thing is, is obviously we've heard, I mean, I know I've heard from working with students for years about the need for keyboards, mm -hmm. about the need for that greater screen real estate for, for both the educators as well as for the students. Um, is that something we're going to be able to promise? Because I know you've been working on a couple of ideas, but is that something that if we pass this, we're going to be able to say, you're going to at least get keyboards right away, even though we may not have that full plan? Yeah, I think that when we look at... student and staff devices. I think there are some of those areas where you, if you go back even further, they, we've heard you, we've gathered feedback from all these different stakeholders, students, staff, admin, our community, we've heard you loud and clear. And, and these are the areas that you want us to address with our technology. If we go out and say, we can check the boxes on these areas, say that, that's our, that is what we're going to do, that's what I'm comfortable saying is that, yes, if we go out, we're going to check the boxes on these key themes, like a physical keyboard or a backward-facing camera. So I'm comfortable absolutely putting myself out there, my team, and saying, if we go out, we've heard you, community, we've got the feedback, these are the things that we're going to check the boxes on. You know, and just as an example, and this is not a plug for any device whatsoever, but... Since we're talking about devices, I happen to have it with me. Um, just here, we'll show and tell, pass it around. That's with the case in the automatic so, keyboard. Fine, so, get to talk. Can you just, because so, I already asked this question of yeah. you earlier, but, uh, and I don't have kids in yeah, school anymore. Um, backward facing camera, why that is such a. Oh. Yeah, great question. Because so, I feel like it might be someone else's question. Yeah. Um, so that they can easily document their work. So if, if you have a student. So if you, as, yeah, so backward facing camera and, and you're working on a project, whether you're, you're mm -hmm. taking film or your mm -hmm. static photos, backward facing camera is really handy to have to yeah, document that work or, or that video, whatever you're working on, having that camera that's facing backwards is really helpful. Now, if you're in a Google Meet, you want that camera facing you. Right, right. but you want the option. <laughs> You want the, yeah, exactly, you want the, the option to, to Yeah, have, and a so. lot of the newer ones that are out there have that option and can shift. Yeah. Um, so... So with that in mind, um, now there's the other thing, when we talk about equity, um, that happens in all different circumstances where you know the kids that go home and they have computers of their own and stuff like that, they tend to use the larger, more robust laptops at home and, then, and they have an advantage over that. Now in COVID, we saw families, uh, even, even our what we consider well-off families running out of internet at home, um, not having local storage on the devices, mm -hmm. and also because of the shortage of devices that went on during COVID, okay. um, they also found that, that you know, the, the disparity of what happens when the only thing they have to work on is, is an iPad with no keyboard. Right. So with that in mind, when we're going forward, one of the biggest issues that we've heard other than the keyboards and the backward facing camera is the fact that, um, a lot of the, the smaller devices, particularly Chromebooks, can't really work if they're not connected to the internet. Right. Um, so is, is that something that we are going to address with the tech levy? Yes, I would like to think so. Is that, um, are you, uh, but I want to be clear on, I want to make sure I'm tracking your question. Are you asking, 
because you mentioned Chromebook, so I want to make sure I'm tracking correctly. Are you talking about internet access at homes? Yes, storage and memory when they're not connected to the school, okay. when they're not connected to the internet or don't have the opportunity. We will able. have a better understanding on what where we're at with through uh, some work that we're doing through MDE and there's this digital equity and access survey that we'll be working on. Okay. Um, and we're just starting that process of, and we're working with our SIS vendor, Infinite Campus, on how we're gonna do this survey that's required to send out to every student to talk about devices and home internet. This fall. And this fall. <laughs> so once we, they work out what that's, you know, the templates and what that survey is and how we're gonna distribute it and now we're, how we're gonna get that information back into our SIS, I think we'll have a much clearer picture at what, where we're at as a community with devices and internet access. And then, yes, I would absolutely like to take that data and look at it and say, where are the gaps and how do we close them? Thank you, and that hopefully will come out during this whole levy and referendum process. Yep. So, and we'll the other, the other reminder, and I'm, I'm glad you're talking about this, um, is, you know, barring another horrific event, we won't have hopefully four people at home all day needing the internet and that pressure. So hopefully, that's a one-time thing, and not that it isn't, it isn't a need, but hopefully the demand will be um, greatly changed from what we saw this past 16 months. Yeah, and then the, the other thing is, um, so obviously I'm very much in favor of actually telling people, okay, it may not be a lot necessarily, but the whole process is you're going to actually see a tangible outcome mm -hmm. uh, in your student and in your classroom uh, you know, for this. Um, and it's going to help everyone overall. Um, I, you know, I go with Jonathan, and we've talked about it before, about a life cycle management plan that's been long overdue. Um, that's more resource intensive and something you haven't had the chance to do. I don't think it's because of vendors or anything like that. Matter of fact, I would love to see us decrease the number of vendors we have yep. because that actually costs more in the long run <laughs> than otherwise. Um, but the other thing is curriculum, and that's going back to the the survey results and everything like that because we are saying we're a STEM school, which is the T part of it. And without the, without the technology in the kids' hands, they can't actually have manual hands-on participation in, in everything from art, which is more and more heavily towards the, uh, towards the technology side, uh, you know, obviously math, et cetera. Um, not so much just keeping kids online because nearly, I, from what I could tell, and, and I, you know, I, again, I'm looking at a small percentage, but most of our books and classroom materials have come with online companions uh, for some time uh, that we get no matter what. So it's not just the curriculum that we're going to be allowed to change because that's been ongoing. It's, mm -hmm. it's how we actually engage the student uh, in that learning so they can actually be more a hands-on participant and actually be a, you know, grow our STEM presence. Um, so, you know, and one thing that we have been missing, which is where I'm going to, is um, we don't have, we have, you know, embedded STEM from a programming standpoint, but we still really do lag our, even our neighboring schools in some of the classrooms and some of the curriculum, et cetera, when it comes to programming, when it comes to technology, when it comes to networking skills, things like that, because we haven't had the labs or the capacity to do that as well as the teachers. So is this something that is going to be long-term in the plan to say, okay, I know it's not going to happen right away because right. curriculum doesn't happen overnight. Right. But in two to three years, we, were, we are going to increase the percentage of opportunities for students to take these types of courses. And obviously, if you're going to do that, you're going to need a virtualized machine that the kids can right. have access to, et cetera, which is something we cannot do right now on those iPads. Correct. Uh, excellent question and points. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would love that to be included in the long-term plan on how we look in, to expand those. Um, you know, we are in East M District. So there's an environmental piece in there too, so that's important to call out. And um, but as, in regards to the T with the technology and the offerings that you just mentioned, I would absolutely welcome and love that be part of the plan to look at that. As, T E makes sense. <laughs> T E for technology and engineering, but okay. 
Fair. So, um, but yeah, I would love to have that be a part of it. Great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead, John. Um, not so much a question, uh, <clears throat> just a comment, a suggestion. Um, <clears throat> as we look at these numbers and we look at what Julie provided, Thank you. Uh, this is a suggestion. As we look at the numbers that Julie has provided, we've talked about the budget before. I like that we had the budget conversation before we had this presentation. I think there's some magic for me, not sure why, but in any number that stays below 20 bucks um, in terms of a monthly commitment from our typical uh, taxpayer. And I would support having a conversation about this number being four versus 3.5. Curious for other people's views. I'll add to that. Um, my experience, I came in at the end of the last referendum effort um, and got involved at the very end. And one of the things I heard most frequently from the community was, are you planning well enough that you're building capacity for the future? Are you going to be able to put this you know, referendum out in, for, in our case, construction, et cetera, to build capacity for the families to come. And I think we took that very seriously. I think we have done that. But I will then ask the same thing for technology. If we're going to go out to our community and go from being last to second to last, are we building the capacity we need or do we want to look at a slightly higher number? I will say a year ago we talked about this and we said we cannot go to our community in the middle of COVID and ask for them to partner with us financially. We just can't. You, you brought a great presentation forward, and we just said this is not the time. Obviously, we can't put it off much longer, and we are asking for partnership, but I want to make sure as a board that we are honest with our community and saying, I mean, would four build us more capacity in terms of our opportunities for the learning and, and uh, maintaining and enhancing what we're doing? And so I, I would agree I would be open to entertaining that discussion and saying, look, is this a referendum that will help us scrape by based on going from you know, 8 to 12 to K-12 and bumping up our security, or is this one that's planning for our future? And I, I don't know how much those $2 a month difference make, um, but I would like to be able to say to the community, yep, we heard, we heard you last time, and, and we want to discuss it at this time. So I, I would agree. I'd op I don't know that that's the answer, but I would want to think about it in that terms. Um, Amy? So I hear you and um, would like to think that four is attainable and I want to give that to our students to put kids first, but I think we do have to listen to our taxpayers and what the survey told us that we heard today was 13 to $15 a month is the target that they're comfortable with. And personally, I I... It doesn't matter what I think personally. It's what it, you know. It's who I'm here to represent, and I think um, we have to really respect that thirteen to fifteen dollars a month that we've been told the taxpayers are comfortable with. I think that's, <clears throat> you know, we we want to pass this and we want to see it go through so that our kids don't have to not have devices for two years, so that we can add staff and not wait. So, I would have a hard time supporting anything above what um, what the survey is telling us. You know, the, the three and a half, I can get to the three and a half at $17 a month. I can, I can support that. I don't know if I can support much above it without a little more thought or discussion at least. And I just want to follow up on that. I, did I hear him correctly that he said that was their starting point, but they were open to learning more? Um, in that number that that wasn't that's, the final cap that's or did I misunderstand question. that? I thought he said with, with the limited information he gave that was where the starting conversation was but that we had a, a community that might want to engage in some more dialogue about that and what the options were. But I could have misinterpreted that. Um, that's a and, good and question. And I'm not saying I would fight to do more. I'm just saying if we're going to do this, are we building the capacity we need is all. I'm not saying let's charge everyone yeah. two dollars a month more. So no, I, I and yeah. Ju I'm going to ask another question here before okay. you get too far. But 
Uh, and you can address this with this. Um, because there is the option of having an inflationary cause clause in yeah. the yeah mm -hmm. in the um in a operating only operating right. you can't I do it on these that's technology. true okay you can't do yeah. I have not heard of that but I'd have to look we into can it that out, yeah. but, no okay. I I'm pretty sure the answer was no because we actually asked this before you can in an operating oh, right. Right. Referendum, but this is a tech levy, and I believe it's X amount of money. Okay. Capital projects, yeah. Okay. But it does change per student year over year. So if you're gaining students. Oh, yes, because it's a different, right. right. It's, it's a, a different, different calculator. Formula. That's right. That's right. Okay. Right. The other thing that I want, didn't bring up earlier, but I do want the board to understand that we have two bond issues that would be available to be refinanced this fall. Mm -hmm. It doesn't save a lot of money, but it does save some. It doesn't seem like a lot of money, so let me clarify that. But it, on an average home, it would be about a dollar a month. So for both that of them? helps. For both? Yeah. If for you both, refinance for both. For total, for both. Okay. So we'd be talking about a $1 difference, not a $2 difference. Right, a $1 difference. So if it's a $17 a month or a $19 a month, it would bring that down approximately by a dollar when we refinance that on an average home. So I just wanted you to be aware that that is something that we're also looking at. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. And Mike, do you have any comments or thoughts here? Yeah, my views are, <clears throat> excuse me, very similar to Amy's that based off of what we already heard from the community and from the Morris Slotherman uh, presentation, 10 to $15 seems to be appropriate. Um, I also have the belief of a goldfish will only grow as big as the bowl that it's in. So if three and a half is what the community will support, then we have to grow and um, make do and work with that. If it's four, then we're going to grow to whatever four accommodates. Or is it, I guess the other question is, does four mean six or does four mean we're at 5.5 and the contribution from the general fund shifts from two million down to one and a half? So Great point. It only shifts where the money comes out of, but the benefits remain the same. Mm -hmm. So that's some additional contextual questions that we have to ask to dig a little bit more into whether four is the right number or is it really three and a half. Julie, did you have any comments? I think I said that last time too. I mean, I am comfortable at three and a half based on what I heard from Leatherman two, two times. Um, I also spend a lot of time looking at that five-year technology department budget. And, I mean, if I'm just, a, I think um, Peter mentioned today, people don't want to dig too deep into the weeds. If I just looked at what my technology budget was from the district from 2015, looks like that's about what we need. Obviously, we want to sustain and enhance. I do not want to see us take a step backwards. And that would be why I would be more conservative in what I'd ask the community for. So. Um, well, first of all, um, again, I, I I do dig into the weeds, and uh, I look underneath no. that number. Yeah, you? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd like to see us go out for what we have on the plate right now. Build trust. Make sure we're getting, uh, we're we're following through uh, with that. Um, and I totally disagreed with us not going out in November, as you know, because um, most of the people at that time were not at the point of, you know, get my kids back in school as much as get them a device. And um, even some of the more staunch people that I spoke with, I said for, you know, 10 to $15 a month, if we could get a device into your kids' hands that was more in the line of a laptop with a with a keyboard, you know, I had people who would never vote for a tax increase go count me in. But then as the year waned on, you know, after December and January, and of course the cold sets in here and everything like that, they they lost their their faith in that uh, a little bit more and didn't want anything to do. Again, they 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 related the technology with you're just gonna keep my kid at home. Um, I do think that it would have been ripe for us to tr at least try with, you know, probably with minimal advertising effort actually in November. So I didn't agree with that decision, but um, now that we're through it, um, 
I think what we need to do is go out for what uh, the Leatherman survey said would be realistic, build trust in the community, have them see a return on their investment, a tangible return on their investment, um, and also relieve uh, a part of our general fund that, uh, that in my opinion, um, should never really have been in part of the general fund. We should have gone out for a tech levy years ago when technology became the thing to do, or at least start whittling away uh, at that opportunity. So we're starting a little late. We are, as you could see, one of the few that do not have one, and I want to go for what's on the plate and what we think we can actually pass, make sure we have one bird in the hand instead of two in the bush. Go ahead. Um, I would just like to say a couple things. Um, number one, and we've heard this every year um, when we've talked to Peter Leatherman about any kind of bond or technology levy um, referendum of any kind, is one of the key factors is unanimous support of the board. So as I hear this conversation, that to me is vital. I know what um, we've asked of our staff in the last 16 months, and so to me, that is absolutely vital in this, is that there is unanimous support. So whether that's 3.5 or 4, I just think it has to be, folks have to be all in if this is the direction we're going. I think the other limitation, though, that's really honest, so I appreciate the questions about, you know, is it enough? And I think it's part of what the story is going to have to be with the community. At 3.5 million, we are not at 7 million. We are not at 8 million. We are not at 5 million, which means what we might want to give for our students, we simply will not be able to. Now, that doesn't mean we can't build toward it, and that doesn't mean a replacement cycle down the road because this is a 10-year levy, but I think that's really important. So I think moving forward, a 3.5 is going to do some things and allow us to look at what did our staff say and what did our students say are really important components and features in a device and what can we do around curriculum. Um, but there will, there will be limitations to that. And we just have to be really honest. And I think our, our community will appreciate some of the comments about we don't want to ask too much because we appreciate where they're at. And we need some support right now. Thanks. Um, so um, just at looking at this kind of overall with the budget, um, and then leading into the technology discussion, I think it was well done in the sense that um, we have some, um, I, don't know what I'm, I can't figure out the word right now in my head, but, um, you know, our starting point of where we're starting with the budget is saying for next year is we're going to get 188 students increase. Um, and we're still, and we're at zero. We're saying the, the legislature is going to give us zero money, which... Maybe they give us one, which, as Julie stated tonight, $500,000. Um, with the 188 student and um, the zero, we still are planning on cutting $2 million. So that's our reality, I think. Um, you know, that's the plan right now if we weren't to go out for referendum. I think... Um, you know, Mary, and you, you brought us up a few times, and you have, and it, since I'm the only one that's actually sitting here for 11 years um, and have sat through numerous referendums, operating, bond, seen passing and failing, it's the only time Peter Leatherman has ever said we've moved from tax hostile to, what did he say? Tax sensitive. Sensitive. <clears throat> so this is not an easy community to pass anything in. Um, I've been involved with that for almost... 15 years, I think, doing that kind of stuff. So I never take <laughs> that decision uh, very lightly. And so um, we've managed on a budget to be very conservative up until the last two years of not having to cut for eight years on very minimal amounts of uh, increases from legislature, on having a, a well-respected district that people want to put their kids in. So, yes, I do believe that we have to, you know, go out there, make our claim. I, I, I wholeheartedly believe our families trust us. I know the last year and a half has been difficult. Um, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Later tonight, we're going to rescind the face covering policy. 
you know, hopefully we don't ever have to have one again. So um, we want things to go back to as normal as possible and to get our kids back in school, 365, you know, how many ever days they're supposed to be, yeah. whatever it is. 60. Yeah. Whatever, you guys know. Um, <laughs> and I think we owe it to our community before we go out again for a third year to cut, to give them a chance to say, okay, can we put some more funding in the schools? Um, you know, I, it kills me to do that. And so I think we have um, a case out in front where we have this opportunity to be able to use technology as a dedicated fund. We've done the best that we can up until this point. And, you know, we need, whether it be talking to our legislatures, talking to our parents, there needs to be a serious look at how our schools are funded. This is... A, a situation that's going around every single district in the state. Um, everyone is faced with this. And so, you know, it's a plea to the public, really. Um, get yourselves educated. Really look at where this money comes from, how they're, you know, the buckets and where the money is going from. Julie's a great resource with that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's something we fight every day. And so, um, I do think 3.5 is the right number. Okay. I, that's just, that seems to be the sweet spot. And I, I think it's something that, Terry, as you said, we need to be unanimously behind this and going forward and being advocates for this, for our kids. Because I don't want to turn around next, you know, whenever we do this again, and have to turn around and cut $2 million from our program again. That would be extremely disheartening. Because each year it's, deeper and deeper. So um, I think at that point, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. I think the direction that the dis that administration's looking forward to is bringing this next time, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it sounds to me like three and a half seems to be the consensus. Um, and that will put this to a vote next time. Based okay. On this presentation. We're happy to do that. We uh, there'll be parts of this you don't see again. You've been seeing some things for a year, so we'll bring part of it back. We'll also at that point have the resolution, the um, ballot language, um, and be prepared for uh, you to seek action on on that. Twelfth. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank for you. coming back from your vacation. Marcus. Thank you, Julie. He did come back from his vacation and is driving. Back. Leaving right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And at that point, um, I'm going to give us a little bit of a break. It's three hours and 20 minutes since we've had a break. So anyone that needs to, and feel free, public, now's a great time. <laughs> We'd love it if you'd stick with us. We have to finish before midnight. Um, <laughs> but if you want to sneak out, this is it. Hmm?